James is having another couple burgers. I made his a bit dark. Let's see if they're edible. Oh, they'll be plenty of fun. So you're going to talk about share this time? Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. Actually, I'm going to finish talking. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like, they pulled the uh, plug on Joe Rogan. Have you ever heard Joe Rogan? No. Holy. Apparently he's a big internet phenomenon. He's the idiot who posted about 20, was it 25 years ago, Fear Factor? Oh, okay. Now he's become a huge internet phenomenon. And recently he's been playing up a lot of conspiracy theories, you know, like about COVID. Probably about other things. Well. So, like what? Pretty well, everything. Like, I don't know exactly what's involved. You know, like I'm not gonna okay. uh, get on the internet, and check it out. But no. uh, you know, like uh, people are calling for a boycott. And hey, you know, like Joni Mitchell and Neil Young pulled whatever content they might have had on their off and this stuff. Uh, I support what they're doing. It's not censorship. If, uh, if you don't want to be associated with some, it, it's a different. It's, it, yeah. it's a company or something like that. But they don't want to be associated with TDC like that. Then uh, that's their. Uh, yeah. That's their choice. Yeah. So this is uh, Blue Period Joni Mitchell. So this is this is a picture of the. Uh, the guy, the bright red devil. Oh, that robe, the red, red robe. You know, the, he features in a few of the songs on uh, her album, Blue. I figured he was uh, something uh, special <laughs> to look at. He's, he's, he's very scrawny. He's scrawny. <laughs> There's zero muscles on him. There's zero muscles. I suspect he didn't even have muscles between his ears. <laughs> I don't know. This is Carrie. That's a great song she wrote about him. <laughs> the bright red devil. <laughs> he, he looks just like a a, a, a wimpy weasel. What an idiot. Oh gosh. Uh, they were hanging out on a cave or something like that uh, in uh, Greece somewhere. Uh, so Matala or Matala. So that's in the Mermaid Cafe. It's mentioned in, I think, uh, the lyrics in Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, Blue. Is that uh, the high water point of Joni Mitchell's artistic career? Well, music career. I'm afraid it might be, and it's not sadly that high. I would, uh, I think, pick it for uh, top 100. Album, rock and roll slash pop albums um, and would I pick any other of her albums well you know like what I would try to do is just pick the top album for the top I want the top album for each of uh, the top hundred uh, people so for the Beatles I'd pick Sgt. Peppers for the Rolling Stones I suppose it'd be Beggar's Banquet or maybe uh Weirdly enough, this is a weird uh, selection. Sticky fingers, um, so on and so forth. And I think if you know, I'd pick Blue for Joni Mitchell's uh, top effort. And um, I don't think it'd be down near a hundred, but it, it wouldn't make my top ten. And I try to be pretty objective. Uh, my distaste for her has uh, grown. I always knew there was this uh, core of coldness in her stuff. Uh, but um, ever since she started, uh, or I started finding out about her slandering Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, I don't know who all else, accusing them of plagiarism, I have really. You know, I start wondering about her uh, accusing Jackson Brown of being a partner abuser or something like that because she's just totally out of whack when it comes to accusing Dylan and Cohen of plagiarism. So uh, she, she, she's, she was amazed at the uh, 
presumptuousness of Leonard Cole. You know, like he he gave her some he gave her some books to read because she didn't have much of an education. She I think that kind of fucked her grade twelve. And then but you did the art college thing. Uh, she did the art college thing. I don't know if she graduated from there, but you're not going to get uh, terribly literate there. Anyway, he gave her some books to read, and she's reading them. She claims to have found the stuff that ended up in Leonard Cohen's poetry, or in the song words. And um, I've run across, uh, you know, she's, she's mentioning a variety of different uh, French poets, as I recall. And, you know, Joni, Dude, when uh, when you take something from someone else and you're writing verse, writing song lyrics in your own language, and you're as good as Leonard Cohen is, it's not even translation. It's nef- definitely not plagiarism. You know, one of the uh, great poems in the Latin language, written by a dude called Catullus. Now, I actually uh, translated that when I was studying Latin um, and um, at university, and that particular poem. And it's, is it plagiarized, ripped off from Sappho, a Greek poet? No, it's a poem in its own right. If you take something that's written in another language, in a certain meter, and you put it in your own language, and even the, uh, an attempt at the same meter, it's not plagiarism, and if you're good, like Catullus or Leonard Cohen, you're not translating, you're writing your own poem, inspired by the other one, by your predecessors in another language, the poem by uh, that person. You got that, Joni? You don't go around saying people are plagiarizing when you do that. When uh, Bob Dylan takes a few uh, quotes from a, a novel in another language, in Japanese, and uh, it might have been translated into English, uh, you might have been dealing with the English translation, and you're putting it into verse or into song lyrics, you're not plagiarizing. Joni, what Leonard Cohen should have done is given you a book of uh, of the complete works, it's not that long, the collected works, shall we say, of T.S. Eliot. Maybe with footnotes, and not just the wasteland with T.S. Eliot's footnotes. And you would have discovered, if you'd read carefully and had gone through this stuff, the footnotes included, you would have found out that T.S. Eliot's works were full of, rife with quotations from other poets, dating back to uh, Dante, uh, dating back to, um, I believe it's uh, the Aeneid, on and on it goes. The Aeneid would be 2,000 years old, roughly, 1,900 years old. And well, that's a strike, because, I mean, yeah. when an artist does that, then they show that, look, I am well-read. I'm well and read and I'm kind of helping you exercise your mind. Yeah. Because so hopefully you've read some I'm, of these things. Exactly. The term for it is not called plagiarism, it's called illusion. It's not illusion. Illusion. Look that up in your funking wagnon. Okay? Joni, before you go get on the horn again and start accusing these poor Individuals, Leonard Cohen dead, Bob Dylan maybe half dead. Shame on you. That's a strength, you idiot. So, Leonard Cohen, I mean, he was getting a little bit older. I can recall there was an album he put out around 2000. He got hold of that CD, and I listened to it a few times. And the one that impressed me was something that he ripped off. No, he didn't rip off. He took it from a Greek poet. Uh... Uh, what is it called? Alexandra leaving or something like that? And uh, it's maybe the best song and or the best lyric on that album. 
But Leonard Cohen was getting a little bit older. But he wasn't plagiarizing. At the worst, he was translating. I don't think he was translating. I think he did a good job of taking something in another language. It might have been a whole lot better than what he produced in the English language. I haven't run across it in the original. But he uh, produced it. He, he did a fine. He, he uh, produced a fine poem in the English language. To call that plagiarism is just out and out slander. Now, in turn, you've criticized Joni. You've criticized Bob Dylan for uh, taking melodies from other people. Now, early on, what he was doing, just what folk musicians have been doing for millennia. Look that up in your funking Wagner. Millennia, that's thousands of years. They'll take tunes from their predecessors. Sometimes it'll be from people working uh, in another country or something like that. You take a tune and you put your own lyrics to it. Check it out. Check it out what, uh, what was done in the blues tradition. In some ways it can be argued it's, it's the same tune all over again. It's basically the same chord progression. So, would that you, in your, the latter part of your career, the huge latter part of your career, uh, starting basically with blue, would you had stolen some tunes? You know, I hope Pauline doesn't mind me mentioning this. One time she was listening to, I try not to visit too much music onto uh, Pauline that she might not like. I knew she didn't really care for Joni Mitchell, but somewhere along the line we were listening to some Joni Mitchell, and it's not that late. I believe it was Hajira, which is sometime in the 70s, maybe 76 or something like that, 77. And all Pauline said something, if I'm misquoting you, I apologize, is, did that woman ever compose a tune? Is that roughly what she said? I have no idea. No. But and I'm going... She, it's like... Yeah, yes, she did, but It's uh, almost off-key. It's like, um, mm. it sounds like when you were telling me about um, the King Midas and how he uh, used a different mode of um, music, well, I mean, his, uh, there was a frigid mode, yeah. but I don't know if... I mean, uh, he did have uh, something to say about music. Because well, he, they didn't like his music? Well, uh, his taste in music. Yeah. Because uh, he... Uh, I, I think he was saying uh, God didn't uh, perform music as well as, as someone else. So, mm -hmm. the God, I think it was Apollo, uh, gave him past his ears, well, then, the ears of a donkey. Yeah, and then there's... I mean, sometimes you listen to music from another culture and sometimes you're like oh wow Indian people they rock or yeah. whatever uh, well, or sometimes you, you don't like it frigid mode is horrible sometimes you listen to music from another culture and, and you really hate it you know like um, uh, some of that Chinese stuff where it's really screechy it's really uh, their opera is a it, little bit hard to take but yeah. I suppose Italian opera for some sure. people is a little bit hard to take yeah when it's not a part of your culture sometimes you're really you know it's like wow I wish I'd heard this all my life and sometimes it's like oh gosh I never want to listen to this again and um, with Joni Mitchell it's like that for me mm -hmm. I don't want to listen to it it's uh, it doesn't sound like music to me um, except for a very few songs, like uh, the one about the, the one that, well, I prefer Sarah McLaughlin doing it. Yeah, I wish I had a river, I know which yeah. one you're going to, I could skate away on. I always it, like that one, beautiful. right from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I'm not saying she's always awful, but mostly awful. I mean, so... And that's really awful, I, is what Pauline yeah, is saying. Yeah, awful. It's not like I mean, average. I like Chelsea Morning, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's... See, that one is uh, one of my favorites by her. The lyrics aren't, by and large, that grand, but she's got some nice images, you know, the sun poured in like... Yeah, but she even does that, in that song she does a do-do-do-do-do-do, or whatever stupid stuff that she does. Is that going? I don't know. She does, she... It's near the end. 
you'd have to go through the whole thing. Like, I don't like it when she kind of like yeah. scats. And it's, it's so like, bad. Yeah. It's so bad. Yeah, it's, she's just wasn't made to perform. And doing with that at the people. end, it's like, oh my gosh, that's what I'm left with. That yeah. awful taste in my brain. You know. Yeah. So. Uh, believe me, she's done a whole lot worse. Uh, what she did, uh, backing Neil Young's Helpless. Uh, on the last waltz, it's, it's embarrassing. And she did that uh, earlier with, uh, I think it was something with Crosby's Nash nice and Young. You know, she's kind of warbling in the background, but it's not really doesn't have much to do with what she's just off. It's solipsistic. You know, David Crosby, who had dealings with Neil Young, and actually produced in a way uh, Joni Mitchell's first released album. Uh, once said about Joni Mitchell, uh, she has the ego of Mussolini. Yeah, and that's Benito Mussolini. And uh, I'm going, Mussolini, uh, you know, like that's putting him in pretty bad company. So she had a high school teacher that introduced her, and I don't, this guy must have been pretty whacked out. Her, and I guess the other students, too, Friedrich Nietzsche. And, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> And this was a big inspiration. That's like where, something guess, a teacher the in uh, the Red Deer area. <laughs> yeah, like Eckville. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who is that? Keekstro is his name. What a shameful idiot. Uh, I, I'm afraid with a name like that, he'd probably be Dutch. Keeks, uh, probably Frisian. I shouldn't say Dutch. There's a difference. So. Could have come from Holland. Couldn't have come from Germany. Islands off of Germany. Could have actually come from the islands off of uh, Denmark. So there's this... Uh, strain of weird, weird duck uh, fascism or, or stuff. I don't want to call it necessarily Nazi Nazism. Um, I don't like overusing those uh, sorts of terms. But, um, you know, white supremacy, white supremacy, and stuff like that in the central part of Southern Alberta. I mean, there are, uh, when we moved down to uh, Sterling, our family, my family, from Calgary, I joked to my mom, uh, you know, like, did I fall asleep in the car, and did we wake up in, Te did I wake up in Texas? So Sterling is 20 miles uh, south of, uh, roughly 30 kilometers south of Lethbridge, Mormon community, one of the big four Mormon communities. It wasn't that big back then. Uh, it wasn't that big uh, back then. But um, yeah, they were all drawling. I, I joked with my mom. Uh, uh, a little while later, after I found out about the Mormons, we were there seven years, and um, uh, I said, you know, when they when they're on holidays, when they want to be good, they go south of the border, down Mexico, not from Mexico, but uh, they go south of the border, they go to Salt Lake City. When they want, when they they go a little bit further down to Las Vegas, when they want to be bad, uh, and they do both. Right? So. Um, Anyway, uh, Joni Mitchell uh, uh, introduced to Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, you know, like uh, Bertrand Russell, I think, had the most reasonable assessment of Nietzsche. You know, Nietzsche's talking about the value of slave culture, and you get guys like the guy who translated pretty well all of his stuff into that uh, stuff. Into, uh, English of uh, Walter Kaufman or Walter Ka Kaufman, I don't know how to pronounce his name. And he was saying, "Oh, you know, like this is—he's uh, kind of like dismissing away this talk about uh, the value of slave culture and stuff like that." You know, uh, Nietzsche saw the value of uh, slave culture. He, he wanted to revive uh, something like class, classical slave culture. You know, the Greek and uh, Latin stuff. So it's horrible stuff. Now, uh, Walter Kaufmann was right in the sense that Hitler misinterpreted a lot of what Nietzsche had to say. He didn't misinterpret that uh, stuff about slave culture. But uh, Nietzsche was actually a pro-Semite, not an anti-Semite. And he was uh, pro-French, anti-German. <laughs> got all that stuff bass backwards. <laughs> but the slave thing. No, you know, like uh, Hitler was anti, or uh, Nietzsche was anti-socialist. 
and uh, you know like he, he basically he was anti-christian and uh, he was saying it was uh, the it was, he, he kept on talking about it I think it was the term he used resentismo, resent something like resentment you know like it's it's uh, it's the envy of the weak for the uh, strong and he uh, worshiped the strong and Walter Kaufman would be saying well, that's not strong physically yeah it's like um, we talked uh, we've talked a lot about aggressive dictatorial types that's what they're like they don't have to be if people who go pound out other people like uh, militias and uh, Nazis and fascists and stuff like that they can be uh, people who uh, think that they're really really like Sheldon Glass, Glass, Glass is that his name now that stupid physicist uh, who uh, really thinks he's hot spit because he's never took a course in solid state <laughs> solid state physics I think he actually did start off one he's kind of fucking out on it or something like that hey dude check it out you know one of your predecessors a guy who uh, did work at McGill University started off in New Zealand and ended up in uh, Cambridge I think it was Cambridge got some time you have eight minutes eight minutes Cambridge uh, he died I think 1939 he was, uh, I think, the last major physicist to say the nucleus was solid. Check out the numbers. The magic numbers. The magic numbers aren't magic enough. The woman who came up with them, the term at least, won a Nobel Prize for it. Maria Geppert Meyer, I believe is the name. I believe the Nobel Prize was awarded somewhere around 1958. She glom two types of magic numbers together the, the magic numbers for the numbers of protons and the numbers of neutrons in the most stable nuclei she shouldn't have mixed them together because when you separate them you start seeing a pattern or a couple of them that you don't see when you mix them together why would she mix them together? Because she was starting out. She deserved the Nobel Prize, but she won it over two generations ago, and no one has progressed beyond what she did. No one has found out the patterns. Plural. It's a duel, really. And you know what? There's a pattern that she never discovered at all. You didn't mix them up in there. There's the pattern for the total number of protons and neutrons. That's your homework, folks. That's your homework, kiddies. Because if you find a pattern in the most stable nuclei for, uh, uh, for the numbers of protons and the number of neutrons combined, then you're on to something because there's a third there are three not just two much less one there's no pattern when you mix the the pro the number of the protons and the number of proton pro, uh, neutrons in the most stable nuclei there's no pattern visible when you separate them out then there are two patterns but then when you add those numbers together there's a third pattern there's a third one you're going to do the homework you can discover it. I'm not going to let you be co-discover. I, I discovered those patterns uh, well before you ever did. But you know, Richard Feynman said, when I uh, duplicate the work unknowingly of someone who came before me, uh, I feel really good. Uh, Richard Feynman, won I'm not sure whether he actually deserved a Nobel Prize, but he did win a Nobel Prize, and he was a uh, high-profile uh, professor, I believe it was at the um, more than any place at that place where the Big Bang Theory is supposed to be uh, a set. Where is that? Uh, it's uh, it's in uh, Pasadena, Caltech. Yeah. So uh, yeah, he was. Uh, that's what he said. So if you can duplicate it, you should feel good. But then, 
you know, like, much more important than discovering the, it is, what we're dealing with are number sequences. Number sequences for the number of protons in the most stable nuclei. Another sequence for the most uh, stable, uh, for the number of neutrons in the most stable nuclei. That one's a little bit, um, it's not so clear. And then it's uh, pretty clear for the uh, number of protons plus the number of ne neutrons in the most stable nuclei. But the important thing is to find out what the physical reality is behind those numbers. And yes, Virginia, there is something like a reality behind numbers. Don't let this stupid quantum theory mishmash uh, craziness get you all mixed up. Like, what is the structure of the nuclei? I've already told you, it's a solid. What type of solid? Is it like plasticine? Is it like glass? Is it like diamonds? Is it like salt? Is it like, I'm giving you a big clue. Is, is, is it like NaCl? Or is it like cesium chloride? Check it out. Check it out. What is the nucleus like? Is it like a sphere? I've already told you, you shouldn't be guessing liquid drop model. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be guessing the gas model and you shouldn't be checking the orbital model. I've already given you huge big hints. But what is it like? Is it like a cube? Is it like a triangle? What is it like a crystal? You know, like with uh, like a kind of hexagonal features? What is it? The numbers will tell you. And you've got to look, the, you've got to check those numbers out. You know, the numbers will eliminate whole possibilities for you. Yeah, yeah, you, you get the quantum physics, they go, oh, wow, you know, like, it's, it's really cosmic. Yeah, cosmic in the 60 sense of the word. You might as well have been smoking dope, you dumb, you dopes. It's cosmic. We're, we're looking for paradoxes. We're looking for for uh, th things that you know, like they're weird. You know, we get this from from Niels Bohr's reaction to uh, Al Albert Einstein. You know, complementarity. Two things. You know, light being a wave and a particle at the same time. That you know, Bohr found that absolutely cosmic. So anytime he found a paradox like that, he's going, "Let's run with this. Run off a cliff with it, you stupid lemmings." You stupid lemmings. You've been running off cliffs following Einstein and Niels Bohr for over a hundred years. You stupid bozos. And you've been going along since Heisenberg. Hey, you know, like, we don't have models. We just use matrices. Matrices are a model, you morons. You oxymorons. Oxy, sharp, moron, dull. It's a paradox in itself, a contradiction in terms. You guys are contradiction in terms. You're strutting around, swanning around, pretending you, you're sharp as tacks. You're as dull as ditch water mixed with dishwater. Thank you.